Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna be revisiting the TRS-80 Model 4P. There's been a couple of videos in this machine series so far, so if you haven't watched those, I recommend you do that first, because as usual with my channel, it'll be a continuation where I left off in the last part. And in that last part, the machine, which is sitting here on the bench, I determined that it wasn't able to run TRS-80 Model 4 software because it seemed to be missing a clock signal that's used for the 80 column display mode. And that is generated by a PLL chip, which I didn't have any spares in stock, so I had to end the repair there. But I have some spares now, so in this video, I'm gonna swap that chip, see if that brings the clock back. If not, then I guess I'll have to do some more diagnosis to try to figure out where exactly it's failed. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Before we get started, I also want to mention that besides this motherboard problem, there are some issues with, I think, the power supply on the main computer, because I've been bench testing this particular motherboard with a TRS-80 Model 3, or yeah, Model 3 power supply, just to eliminate any potential PSU issues. If you go back to part one, before I disassembled the computer, I turned it on and it was acting very strange with weird stuff coming up on screen and it was trying to boot and not booting. I think I showed in part two that when you turn on the computer without any disk in the disk drive, it should say, insert a boot disk on the screen. And I never once saw that message. So I'm fully anticipating once I get this motherboard working, that I'm then gonna have to tackle whatever's potentially wrong with the power supply in the main unit. But I think that should be at least a little easier to do. For testing right now, I have the motherboard here on the bench. I have the floppy drive that I was using for testing, which uh, plugs right there onto the motherboard. I have the TRS-80 Model 3 power supply right there, and the RGB to HDMI is actually connected. Now, one thing that's kind of curious is this ROM right here is what was installed in the machine, and it actually had a little bodge here, plus another wire that ran to a spot on the motherboard. And the reason for this little bit of a bodge here is that this motherboard is expecting to have a TMS 2532 EEPROM or a mask ROM, like a 2332. And the ROM that was in here was actually a 2732. And there are two pins that are swapped around when you compare the 2732 layout to what's on the 2532. And beside those two pins, it seems like one of the chip select lines for the original mask ROM was uh, active high. And the ROM needs it to be active low for the ROM to be selected. So they ran extra wire from this pin here, which I think is output enable over to the ground pin on this EEPROM. There it is oriented the correct way there. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and I made an adapter by stacking a few sockets together to do that exact same mod that was done with this chip. That way I could actually flash a few ROM chips to go in this thing. And the reason why is because David, who worked on the original TRS-80 model one, three and two, ROMs has gone ahead and made a preliminary version for testing all 128K on this motherboard for the 4 and the 4P. I have this EEPROM set up right here with that ROM, but what I have in the motherboard right now is actually the TRS-80 Model 1 and 3 ROM, which I actually kind of assumed it just wouldn't work in this thing, but let me power this thing up and let's see if this, this actually works because it's possible that this thing is, is so TRS-80 Model 3 compatible, the motherboard, at least in the power on state, that this ROM will just work. So we'll get the power in here. There it is. So of course there's a built-in speaker on this motherboard. So we're gonna be hearing the beep tones. And there it is, it's actually working. Uh, the only thing that I'm noticing here is it's cut off a little bit on the right side. Like my last name, Black BLA, and then there's half of the C there. Let's go adjusting the RGB to HDMI and see if I can fix that problem. Okay, there we go. All right, so it looks like I have the C there, but the K is still missing. And you'll notice the entire screen memory actually looks like it's shifted over by one single character. So to the left of the TRS-80 there, you see there's like a weird symbol. And yeah, so obviously there's a little bit of a difference with the way the video RAM is mapped out on this, at least initially at power on. I'm gonna unplug this so we don't have to hear the beeping. So as I was saying, the initial power on state must be slightly different than what the Model 3 is. And I have a feeling that the stock ROM probably reconfigures whatever needs to be configured in the appropriate way so that Model 3 software works properly. The thing is, as you saw with that ROM, it was only testing 48K because it's expecting a Model 3. So it's not gonna test all 128K that's on here. Now the ROM that David made here 
requires 80 columns, and it should test not all of the memory, but most of the memory. I'll talk about that a little bit once I get the 80 columns working on this thing. What I am going to do, though, is I'm going to swap the ROMs around, and we're going to put the Model 4 slash 4P one in here. And the reason why is because the fact that this ROM does require 80 columns, it switches into it right away. And right now, when we turn on the computer, I'll just do it, we get a single beep, and there was a tiny bit of a glitch there, and then that's it. We're getting nothing now. The computer just seems to be dead. It should be running through the RAM tests, making beeps and stuff, just like the Model 3 ROM does. And this has been tested on the emulator that it does generally work. So the fact is, it's doing the same thing as when I booted the software off the floppy disk, where as soon as you go to 80 columns, the computer just freezes. So that's actually a good thing. It's a good test for me to try to get this thing fixed, and then this ROM should hopefully at least display some text or something like that. Okay, so the potentially bad PLL chip, it's this chip right here. At the end of the last video, when I determined that it was probably that PLL chip that was bad, I went ahead and I ordered some replacements, and I got these from a US seller. So they actually came in about a week ago. But the funny thing is, is that Seth, who sent me this computer in the first place, he watched the video, the repair video that is, and he went ahead and he ordered some from me as well. So I have two more packages here. I think he might have ordered from one more supplier. So I should have a good stash of these chips here, more than like a lifetime supply. Because I have to say, I've never run into anything else that used them. And I think when I ordered some, I got five. And I can tell there is extra chips in here, so I probably have more than like five lifetime supplies worth of this PLL chip now. Let's just do a really quick little unboxing here. All right, looks like we have eight chips there in a little tube. All right, you know what's pretty funny is this particular seller here, if you notice the packaging on the chips, I'm pretty sure I bought the, the chips from the same supplier that Seth just bought from. <laughs> they were probably wondering like, why am I sending the same chip to the same person twice? And yes, these are the chips. These are the ones that I ordered, and those are the ones that Seth ordered. The same Philips IC there. Pretty hilarious. All right, well, I think it's time to take this motherboard out of here, and I'm going to at least socket the chip that's in there, and then we can test out what's going on. There were quite a number of comments where people were talking about these capacitors that are all around this little area right here, that if any of these are bad, that could potentially cause the issue that I'm seeing as well, where the PLL seems to be getting the clock input, but there's nothing coming out of it on the clock output side. So if I swap out this IC and we don't see any change, then I'm gonna have to go carefully study those comments to see what people are suggesting and then try to identify a potential issue. Part of the problem is there's a lot of like analog magic happening around this clock stuff, and analog is really not my forte. I prefer digital, <laughs> the digital domain's just a little bit easier for me to get my head around, I suppose, but the capacitors that like shape the signals and adjust the crystal and I don't know, all that kind of stuff is all a little bit beyond me. So hopefully replacing that PLL does the trick. If not, at least my viewers have given me lots of good pointers. And with the jump cut, new socket is installed. There is the old IC, and the interesting thing is the legs are cropped really, really short on this old one. So I don't even know if I'll be able to reuse this again in that socket because the legs are so short. Now the replacement ICs, these ones are from 1995. That was from the same seller. And then the other seller, the ICs were also Phillips, but I think they're from 97. So I guess there aren't a whole lot of these chips floating around left. Oh, actually, hold on. There is another one that was in there, and it's uh, the same brand as the one I took out. The one I took out is from 1983, this one's from 87, but I will go for the older one because why not? All right, I'm not even gonna hook the oscilloscope up. I'm just gonna try this like as is. Now I did tweak that little variable capacitor in the last video, so it may not work right off the bat and the oscilloscope will obviously tell us, but with the diagnostic ROM in there, I'll see if this thing at least comes to life. All right, here we go. And I think, everyone, we are in the same situation we were before, where there's no clock signal. All right, here we are with some hot split-screen action. I happen to have the schematics up from the last time I was working on this machine. I've never rebooted this computer since then. So there's the PLL. Here is the oscilloscope. Let's see what we see. So we should be seeing clock input on pin 6. 
and we are not seeing a clock input. And I remember we did have one there. And of course this jumper, E1 to E2, is what connects the master clock on this computer to the PLL. Now if I touch the top of this jumper here, there is the clock signal, 1.2 megahertz. I don't remember if that's, that's not the master clock, but I think that's the divided clock that this gets. The jumper should be on E1 and E2. Oh, okay, it wasn't actually on there. So let's put that on. All right, there's pin six. We have a nice clock input now. Let's move this down. There it is. All righty, and there is actually a clock output now. Now it doesn't, it doesn't look great. It's kind of up here, so it's wobbly and everything, but I'm gonna adjust that adjustable capacitor there. Let me grab an appropriate tool like this one should do. And we're getting 43 megahertz. That's a little too high. That's not going to result in this thing working, if I recall. What should this be? 12 megahertz is what this should be. Let's check here on U127 on pin 1. Yeah, and absolutely we're getting the exact same way too high clock signal there. Let me try adjusting this variable cap. Let's see, does anything dial this in in a better way? No, it does not. All right, let's think about what's happening here. So the new PLL is definitely doing something. Like, there wasn't any clock output at all. And now I'm getting a clock output, but it's way, way too high. So that's not going to result in a working machine. I'm just going to try one of these other chips for fun here, and because maybe this one's bad. I don't know. Or maybe it's slightly different. I've had this happen before where I bought new old stock parts. Um, I think it was like an amplifier chip or something like that to try to fix some of my amplified speakers. And I think I ordered five and the first two were bad. And I spent so much time troubleshooting, not understanding like why the, the thing wasn't working properly. I had identified it to be the amplification chip that was bad. And the first two chips just did not work. And then the third chip, work perfectly. And I'm still using those speakers today. It's the speakers that sit on top of this monitor uh, behind the camera. And it totally works now. And those were brand new old stock, well, supposedly old stock from a US seller. You just don't know sometimes what the stuff you buy from these sellers. It, they're not tested, right? So it may not work. Okay, so the Philips chip is in there. Let's see if this looks any different. Nope. Well, yeah, it's 51 megahertz now. And looking again here, so this is the clock input here, goes through this uh, 74LS93, I think it like divides the clock down. And then it goes through a voltage divider right here, and then a capacitor, and then that jumper. And if I look at the signal right there on the jumper, and we slow this down, there it is, that is the signal. And now, is that the right amplitude? If we look at Q3 here on U147, there's the output. Now the funny thing is, it's pretty low, like the amplitude is what, 2.6 volts? This is a regular TTL logic chip, so I'd be expecting more to be coming out of this. Let's check the other pins there, pin 8 and 9, which are just not connected to anything, but those should have a similar clock signal on them. So pin 8 on 147 has an amplitude of about 3.5 volts, and pin 9 is hitting a maximum of 3.3 volts. So with the clock signal before the voltage divider, it's definitely on the low side of things. I wonder if I should just jump over the voltage divider as a test and just see if that helps bring the clock signal in a little bit. All right, so I've done these little clips here to bypass things. What I've done is I've clipped on to the left side of R27 here, and then I clipped onto pin E2 right there, but I added a 0.1 microfarad capacitor in line. So I've sort of replicated that cap right there. So there's no more voltage divider there. So let's just see what happens. So what we're looking at here is the 1.26 megahertz that's coming out of that clock divider chip without the uh, voltage divider there. Well, and that didn't seem to do anything at all. We're still getting that like very high clock rate there. All right, well, unfortunately I'm a little stuck here. I just don't really understand how like this IC here relates to the PLL and how the PLL turns that 1. whatever 27 megahertz into 12 megahertz, which is supposed to be running the clock signal. I, it's all a little magical to me. So I'm gonna go consult the comment section and see what people are saying in the, the last video on this computer. So I took to the comment section on the last video and I have to say there were numerous very helpful comments, but I've singled out this one here by Oval Team. 
Here's the full comment that Ovaltine wrote, but essentially, let me distill it down here. So the master clock comes in, or I think it's like 20 megahertz, and this chip here divides it down to 1.25 megahertz, which then goes through this voltage divider, which I mentioned, and that feeds in to the PLL. What the PLL essentially is, is a voltage controlled oscillator. And what that really means is that with the absence of any kind of input signal, so if I remove this jumper E1 to E2, it should still oscillate at a set frequency, around a set frequency. And that is controlled by this variable capacitor here, C231. That sort of sets like the base frequency of the oscillator that's built into the PLL itself. Then what happens is that that frequency is output here on pin nine, and it goes into this TTL logic chip here, which then divides it back down again to around 1.25 megahertz. And you notice how it's feeding back in along with the signal that's coming from the master clock. And the reason why is because it wants to align the output from the voltage controlled oscillator with that input signal. And that's what Ovaltine is saying here. It says the frequency should be bumped around by the phase mismatch between pins three and pin six. There's pin six and there's pin three. So any kind of output mismatch on the voltage control oscillator will be brought in to basically a lock, which is the phase locked loop that will then ensure that the output clock is exactly phase locked to that input signal. So Ovaltine's comment got me thinking. The PLL, if I remove this jumper, it should still be generating a frequency around 12 megahertz. And the variable capacitor that's on the board here, I should be able to tune that and basically get it oscillating close to 12 megahertz. And then when I put that jumper back on, it should then allow it to lock on perfectly to that master clock, which is divided down to 1.25 megahertz. Now, taking a look at the data sheet, we can see that pin 12 and 13, that is the variable capacitor, which is this part right here. Now, interesting, if I zoom in a little bit, you see it has these two resistors here, but it says NU, not used. And those are actually not installed on this motherboard at all. So that stuff doesn't even come to play. It's literally just this C231 connected to pins 12 and 13. And then here it is, the VCO on the block diagram, and you can see again, 12 and 13, that's that variable capacitor to set the base clock rate that the VCO should be running at, free running that is. If nothing's connected to it, it should still be generating that frequency. Take a look at this table here, VCO free running frequency with C1, which is that variable capacitor at 91 picofarads, it should be running at 6.5 megahertz. And if we go back to the first page, it says right here, guaranteed operation to 50 megahertz. Well, remember what was happening. This thing seems to just be running around 50 megahertz, that, that oscillator there, which is clearly not working. And I was adjusting that variable capacitor and it didn't seem to be doing anything at all. Ovaltine says in the comment here to check the variable capacitor uh, that it's connected to the IC on both of those pins, 12 and 13, although they think it would be because it was having a DC effect adjusting it. And indeed, earlier when we saw generating that 45, 50 megahertz frequency, turning it did have some effect on it, although it wasn't really what we would expect though. So what I've gone ahead and done is I removed the variable capacitor. There it is right there. I wanted to test to see what the actual rating of this was out of the board. You really have to do that with these very tiny little capacitors. So I'm gonna use my LCR meter here and let's connect it up to this. Now I'm using the little short leads here because when you have this low of capacitance, uh, hooking up long clip leads can definitely affect your measurement. Okay, so we're getting 9.6 picofarad the way it's adjusted right now. Looking at the schematic, it should be between six and 50 picofarads. So using a ceramic tool for adjustment, because I don't want to stick things that are metal in there. Let's see what range we're getting out of there. So can you see that on there? Yep. Okay. I'm turning it. I'm turning it. Hopefully that's very visible. So now we're at 3.1 picofarads, which is too low. Uh, let's keep turning this. So the way these work is they kind of turn continually. Five, five, eight, we're at 10, nine, 10, 11. Okay, we're at 12.8 and we're back to 11.2 and we're back to 10. I think it's going back down again. So we're not seeing the desired range out of this adjustable capacitor. In fact, everything is on the relatively low side. The, the picofarad numbers are low. Remember when we take a look at this data sheet, let's find it again. 
6.5 megahertz at 91 picofarads. So that kind of tells us the higher the capacitance hooks up to pins 12 and 13, the slower the oscillator is going to be. So that kind of tells us the fact that this thing is too low, it means that this thing is going to oscillate way too fast. And I guess that's why with me adjusting it, it just never really went to a sensible speed. It was always running too quickly because it just never got into those higher ranges like the 30s and 40 and 50 picofarads, which it's supposed to. So unfortunately, I don't have any more of these little adjustment things. But what I do have is a box filled with various little picofarad type capacitors. So I went in the other box and I grabbed this one here which I have no idea if this is actually visible on there, but it says 33, so it's a 33 picofarad cap. I'm gonna just stick in various values of capacitors into the holes on the motherboard here, and let's see if we can find one that actually seems to generate a frequency that's close enough. The thing is, we don't have to get it perfect, and the reason why is because the PLL nature, the fact that it's a phase-locked loop, means that as long as it's close, it will actually lock in and get right onto the exact frequency it needs to be based on these dividers that they put on the motherboard here. So I'm gonna remove this uh, jumper that's on here and basically just stick this into the holes here. And I prop the screwdriver under the board because it has the lead sticking out, but there the capacitor is in there and the, it's touching the sides of the vias. So that should be good enough. With the, with the jumper removed, that means that when I power this up and we look at the output of the PLL, we should just be seeing essentially the output of the oscillator without being locked to that initial input clock signal. So the oscilloscope's up, let me plug in the power and let's see what happens. Okay, let's look at the output. Ooh, hey, look, what, whoa, okay. <laughs> it's making extra beep sounds because that implies that it's actually working. Now you notice how it's jumping around quite a bit? Um, okay, so it's obviously, it's actually running. The machine is actually running, even though this frequency is not locked. What this means that, well, what does this mean? I think if we had looked at the video on this thing, it would probably be jumping all around because it's not locked. And you see the frequency here, 12.1, 12.2 megahertz. Let's plug in the jumper here and it should lock right on. Boom, look at that. I mean, the frequency counter on this oscilloscope is not perfect but you can see it's now not jumping around anymore and it seems to be running around 12.8 megahertz or so. I don't know what the exact frequency that it should be running at is, but I do know that putting that jumper on and feeding that master clock into it is causing it to lock on. And that is what we're seeing. And you hear all the beeping the computer's making, that's because this is the diagnostic ROM and it's running through all the RAM tests. And the RAM tests, as it tests the different banks or different parts of memory, it creates those beep tones. So, a couple interesting things actually, observation-wise. My hunch that this clock, this 12 megahertz clock that's generated by this PLL, was used outside of just the, the 80 columns mode must be true because without the capacitor in there, or without, you know, with this bad one that was in there, it wasn't generating the right frequency, and the computer would just lock up immediately as soon as it went to 80 columns mode. But even without that thing locked on, because I had the jumper removed, it was actually running the diagnostics there. And now with that cap in there, it is locked right on. Now, I don't know if the frequency we saw there was the exact right frequency that it should be, but I'm assuming that there's quite a wide range where the PLL can lock on and it kind of overrides whatever uh, capacitor that I have in there. I guess I could try a slightly different value and we can see if it actually goes away from that 12.7 or whatever megahertz it was running at. Okay, I found a 22 uh, picofarad one here. And remember we have a 33 in here now. The power is currently off. I have set the jumper to just be on one pin so it's not in play. And I'll put this on there so we plug it in. Okay, we're at 17 megahertz now. Let's see if we put the jumper on, if it can actually bring that in. Uh, no, it's not locking on, so it's still all over the place. It sounds like the computer is actually working though, which is interesting. So it's sort of overclocking the video or whatever was happening. But I think what that does is it shows that you need to be close-ish for it to lock on. And we saw that with the jumper on, it was still all over the place. But with this 33 in there, I'm gonna say that that value is good enough for it to lock on. So let's try that again. Okay, 
So it's jumping all over the place and it's 12 megahertz. And as soon as I put the jumper on, there it is, boom, locks right on. And it's nice and solid now. That's awesome. Now the slight jittering you're seeing on here is just really the triggering on this uh, virtual bench is not perfect. It's not a super high frequency scope. So I think that's pretty normal. But uh, like I said, I think it's uh, looks like it's a pretty stable signal now. So I'm gonna say that this is a good value, at least for this board. And I'm just not gonna replace it with this adjustable one. The capacitor is soldered onto the board. I just wanna make sure that we're still getting that nice solid lock. Power this up. There it is, that looks good. Now I think we're all asking the same question. Was this original chip actually bad? And um, I'm thinking that it probably wasn't. Maybe what was going on is that this original chip from 1983, without the capacitor working, like I don't mean, obviously it had some kind of value, but it was clearly not happy. It is possible that that voltage controlled oscillator on this other chip just wasn't running properly without some capacitance on those two pins. So it's quite possible that if I put this back in, it's now gonna work. I mean, and the only unfortunate thing is the pins are so short on this that this doesn't stay in. Well, it's in, so maybe it's gonna work. So the oscilloscope is on the output of the original chip and oh, look at that, freaking works. So this chip is good. So I do apologize, PLL chip, I falsely accused it of being bad when a passive went bad. I, I'm looking for the, I don't even know where I deal with it, okay. So now the question is, uh, a couple things. Does the RGBD HDMI profile here even work in 80 columns mode? It may not, because I'm using the TRCD Model 3 profile and there's no profile on here for the Model 4 like 80 column mode. That's something I'm gonna have to make, I guess. So um, oh, let's just see what happens. Okay, well, we can see that it's trying to display. Oh, <laughs> look at that. It just freaking works. Wait, so it actually looks like it's back in 64 column mode right now, which is why it's working. Um, and I think David told me that the VRAM test is the only part that's running in 80 column mode. Now, finally, we get a look at the new Model 4 and Model 4P diagnostic ROM. It's awesome to see it working. The thing about this computer that makes RAM tests really difficult, there's two things, is it has banks of memory that are 64K each, right? If you think about it, it's these 64K RAM chips, but the memory map, unfortunately, is a little bit convoluted. There is no easy way for us to run the ROM code while we're testing the entire first bank of memory, which is like the lower 64K. And that's because when you turn that memory map on for the full low 64K, the ROM is no longer mapped into memory. So you would have to copy the diagnostic ROM into the RAM and then run it from there. But the problem is we don't really know for sure if the RAM is good, right? That's, that's part of the problem. So David had to like break up the RAM test into various chunks. So see it's testing the low 48K. That's the Model 3 equivalent part of the memory where the old ROM space and stuff used to sit at the bottom. So we're testing that and then we're testing both halves of the upper 64K. So that extra memory that's an addition on this thing where it can have either 64K installed or we're gonna have 128K. So the RAM test is testing the upper 64K properly, but we cannot fully test all of the lower part. The only way to test like the whole 64K on the lower half is we'd have to have ROM diagnostic code that could run in the upper part of memory after it tested to make sure it's working and then sort of take over the diagnostics. And uh, so David made this ROM that does as much testing as he can easily do. I think we don't have to worry though, because booting Model 3 software loads the Model 3 ROM into that lower part of the memory, which is what's not being tested, and we know the system was booting. So that kind of validates that, that all the RAM is working. Now, if we reset things, it's a little worrisome that the 80 call mode looks like that, but that might be okay. That just could be the RGB to HDMI, like just misinterpreting everything. So I'm not gonna jump to the conclusion that 80 columns is broken right yet. Not until we get this thing hooked up to the CRT. Okay, I think the thing I need to do now, is we gotta go back to the stock ROM and let's boot back up that diagnostic disc that had the 80 column test on it so we can 
see if it's crashing anymore. And I'm assuming it's gonna totally work now. All right, the disk drive is connected. Let's power everything on. And there we go, floppy disk drive is not ready. So I'm gonna stick in the diagnostic disk here, the one I made last time. Let's reset the thing. Oh, I need to plug the keyboard in, don't I? Otherwise I won't be able to type anything. Loading ROM image, it says. Let me find the keyboard. Okay, keyboard is connected. We're booted up. Where did I go? Uh, video and keyboard diagnostic menu. I think it was there for the 80 column test. Number eight. Okay, so it's drawing text. I just need to fiddle with the controls here. So I'm gonna do that on the RGB HDMI, try to get this locked in. Alrighty, after much fiddling, I have created two profiles for the TRC Model 4 and 4P. I think they're both the same. And unfortunately, RGB to HDMI right now doesn't have the ability to auto-detect the two different modes. I think they're too similar to each other. Although, uh, I need to talk to Ian, the maintainer of the project. He may give me the tips I need to make it auto-detect. But right now, we're in the Model 4 diagnostic menu again. Let's go to video tests. And if we look at the video alignment pattern, it turns out that that's actually in 80 columns mode. And there we go, it looks terrible. But if I go into the menu here, and we switch this to 80 column, and there it is. Now, there is a little weird glitching that you see every once in a while. I don't know for sure if that is the RGB to HDMI or the motherboard that's doing it. Uh, we'll find out when we hook up the CRT, obviously. I'm thinking it's the RGB to HDMI that's, that's doing this. I think it's like the exact combination of clock speeds and whatnot. It just causes that weird little random glitch. But as you can see, we're definitely getting a functional 80 columns and the computer seems to be working. So I think at this point, let's try CPM. I happen to have a CPM disc right here. And every time I tried this originally, uh, model four CPM, here it is, it would just give us a black screen and freeze, which obviously was a problem. And actually, now that I think about it, the clock signals, that 12 megahertz clock, goes into these GAL chips, or some of those GAL chips. And I bet you it's used to synchronize some other outputs or something like that. So when it's not there, it just those outputs don't work. So let's reboot this. I'll leave it in 80 column mode because that's clearly what this disk will be in if it actually works. It's accessing the drive. Okay, good. Before it access the drive, it just stops spinning after a split second. And look at that, CPM plus. I'm also not seeing a cursor which is a bit weird. Oh, okay, it's blinking very quickly. Oh, it did not like that. The date, really, I guess not Y2K compatible. Let's try 89, okay. All right, there we go. We have CPM running on the Model 4. <laughs> that is cool. So yeah, the CPM on here is a Z80. It's fully compatible with any CPM software from any other machine. You just have to copy it onto disks that this thing can read because the disk format is a little bespoke. But software-wise, the BIOS that's in the CPM will translate any of the calls to the keyboard or the screen and stuff like that. So it should just work. Alrighty, so the motherboard. I think it's fully working now. I haven't thrown everything in the kitchen sink at it yet. We'll do that inside the computer, but 80 column mode is fixed. It's running, it's outputting good video. It seems to be working, it's loading Model 4 software finally. The diagnostic ROM does work and it was able to test that upper memory. So I know that that top 64K of RAM works as well. So I'm gonna say that this thing is back to being functional. So I guess now I need to try to put this thing back together. Hopefully I still remember how. All right, we have the great reassembly that needs to go on with this machine. But before we do that, there's a couple things. First off, I wanted to see about a mod that was mentioned in the technical service bulletin about making the screen brighter because it seemed a little bit dim when it was running. Well, it turns out that this thing already has the mod done. There's one resistor that's here by this wire, which is the video signal input, and there's another resistor up here that gets removed. And the resistor is already removed, and I checked the resistance on the one that's down here by the wire, and it's supposed to be 91 ohms. This is after the mod. The original is 120. So that kind of implies the mod's already been done. 
And then we had the power supply issue with this thing. So right off the bat, there's two reefas, so I gotta replace those. I happen to have the replacements right here, so that's gonna be nothing very difficult. But then there was the issue that Seth mentioned that he had to like close the disk drives to get the computers to turn on. I think that was just a coincidence that it worked that way. I think the reality is it just took a long time for this power supply to start up. Now when I tried it, it turned on right away, but then we didn't get the video display and just weird things were happening. So I'm gonna check the capacitors, these small caps right here on this section of the board. If you look at the topology of this power supply, the high voltage or the mains comes in here and it runs along this part of the board. And this whole section here is like the high voltage side of the power supply. This is the switch mode power supply controller here. So these little caps here, they need to be working properly for this whole like voltage comparator stuff to work. There's an opto coupler right here, which couples this low voltage side with just five and 12 volts and stuff to the high voltage side. So the controller knows how to regulate the pulse width modulation that then you know regulates the voltage on this side. I don't see any potentiometers on this thing for adjusting the actual output voltage. Usually there's one for adjusting like the five volts or the 12 volts and all the other voltages are derived from that same regulation. There may actually be issues over here too with some open caps or whatever that could cause ripple. In fact, you know what, I'll just, uh, these large ones aren't usually gonna be a problem unless they leak or something, but these small ones, they might be a problem. So I'm gonna be using the LCR meter and I'm just gonna quickly go over these small caps and see if I can figure out if any are, are weak or open and then I'll swap those out. Having gone over the caps, nothing really looks actually too out of the ordinary. These two small blue caps right here have sort of high ESR, but they're, they're 50 volt caps though, and 50 volt caps uh, usually have a little bit of a higher ESR. That's just normal. So I'm not sure there's actually a problem there. Here's an example. This is a brand new 3.3 microfarad cap at 50 volts. Let's, uh, let's see what this reads on here. So yeah, we're getting 3.1 microfarads at 4.3 ohms, and this is at one kilohertz. I mean, that's actually basically the same as what I was getting with those. So that really means nothing seems out of the ordinary with this power supply. Looks to be in really good shape. I did take a quick inspection on the bottom. I didn't see any bad solder joints. Everything looks actually really good quality on here. Uh, these things were aftermarket, these discs here. Mavs, I guess, they were added after the fact. Must have been some kind of safety mod or something that Radio Shack had to do. So let me quickly swap out these reefers here. There's one Rifa out. And yeah, by, by the way, I use these, uh, what, hemostats, I think they're called, to grab capacitors. They're very handy. I saw Jordan Peer using them on his channel. He actually runs a business repairing stuff. And, um, and the really good thing about these, if you're pulling out like a small part, like that's way down in there, it's really easy to grab onto it with these and, and pull that out. All right, there are the two Rifas out of there. I'm just going to use this braid here to clean up what's on the board before I pop the new ones in. With these modern ones, there's no polarity or anything you have to worry about. You just want to replace uh, the, the value, the like-for-like like value. Well, and of course, it goes without saying that if you're taking out a Y cap or Y1 cap, you need to replace it with another Y or Y1 or Y2 cap, and then the same goes for the X caps. All right, just like that, power supply is serviced, I guess. Re Reefas are replaced. I didn't find any other issues, so that's, I don't know, that's not great because clearly this machine was misbehaving when I first turned it on. So we got to figure out what exactly is going on there. Um, maybe it was a bad connection here. I know these, these have good solder joints, no issues there, but maybe there's just, I don't know, a little oxidation on the pins. I'm going to measure the voltage rails and stuff on this thing just to see what kind of things it's doing. And actually, taking a look again, looks like there is at least one broken solder joint on here, and it's uh, it's one of the ground pins. So maybe that was the one that goes to the CRT, which is why the CRT wasn't running, initially at least, uh, when I powered on the computer. Okay, there we go. So I fixed at least something on here. So far, these are the bad parts I've changed so far. Two reefas and one variable capacitor. That's it. One thing I didn't pay attention to is how this board was mounted because it can go obviously this way or 180 degrees. So we'll find out if the cables fit. In fact, before I put all the screws in, it goes like this, it goes like this on there. Yes, okay, it is, that, that's correct. This is the, the side that the cables plug into. All right, so here is the computer. The motherboard is just sitting on the bottom. It's not screwed in because of course I have to take the 
motherboard off to put the keyboard in again, which is such a dumb design. So these are all the connections that go onto the power supply. So this is for the mains. This is for the floppy drive, which would be over here. This cable here, this seems to be for the monitor. That goes right there. Uh, let's see what else is there. There's this connector here. What does this go to? There is also an extra connector right there on the motherboard, but I'm assuming that was for the fan or something. But it's funny because it's basically the same as this, which could plug in there, but that doesn't make sense. Why would that plug there? I'm not really sure. So we're just gonna leave that like that and uh, try it out this way. All right, moment of truth. Obviously the disk drives aren't connected, so I'm expecting to get that message about the drives not being ready. There we go. I heard the power, the uh, monitor start up, so that's a good sign. You know, I can measure some of the voltages off these RAM chips right here as well if I need to. Hey, look at that. Okay, so this thing is obviously behaving a lot better than it was. Interesting. All right, on the 12 volt rail, we have 12.68, so that's a little high, but not much I can do about it because there's no way to adjust things. And there we go on the five volt rail, 4.949 volts. So that's totally fine for all the logic that's on there. Now it's interesting. Um, I know it's blanking a little bit in the camera, but this is just not that bright. We can turn up the brightness, which makes the retrace appear, but the contrast, which is this one, that's just all the way up right now. And it is just not that bright. That's kind of lame. I wish it were better. And I don't actually think that this CRT is worn out. I didn't see a lot of evidence of that on the uh, back when it came to that soot and it doesn't have burn in. It just seems like the cathode drive on this particular board just doesn't push much signal through to the cathode. I'm going to lift the cover on this again. I just want to take a look at the CRT board. It does have some controls along the top edge. I just want to see if anything there looks like it might give me some more brightness. What we're getting up here is internal brightness, focus, horizontal hold, vertical size, vertical linearity, and vertical hold. Those are all the controls. Oh, this is a width coil as well, which I can adjust to make it wider. I have a hunch that this internal brightness control simply is the same as the brightness knob on the front, and there's tons of brightness available with that knob. So I'm not really sure that's gonna be much help. We need to adjust the cathode drive level, and there doesn't appear to be any adjustment on here. All right, there we go. I'm gonna adjust this one that says internal brightness control. And yeah, that's just the same as uh, this external brightness control, this one here. That doesn't do anything else. Now, what's a real bummer is if the CRT is worn out, the thing about the CRT on this thing is the mounting tabs are actually towards the back of the implosion band here. And here is a Macintosh CRT. And you can see the difference here. The mounting tabs are towards the front instead of towards the back. So I can't take one of these CRTs out of a Macintosh, which might be in really good shape, and stick it inside of here. I suppose now I think about it, I could print a spacer and then use a much longer screw, and then I could actually swap the CRT out. So that's a possibility. All right, before I continue with the assembly process, I'm going to try this floppy drive here on the machine so we can see it actually boot into 80 columns mode. I wanna make sure that that actually looks good on the screen here. All right, here we go. Let's turn that on and we'll turn on the floppy drive. It's definitely booting and this is the CPM disk, so it should go right there. There it is, 80 columns mode. And I gotta say, the 80 columns, looking very closely, it is absolutely rock solid and super sharp. I turned off the studio light so we can get a good image here on the camera. Now it looks way brighter than the camera than it is in real life. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go check the schematics and look at that resistor that they had us change from 120 ohms to 91 ohms. And I'm gonna look at where that is in the circuit exactly to see if piggyback on top of that one to bring it down to like 40 ohms or something would actually increase this uh, overall contrast on the image here. All right, what I've gone ahead and done is I jumped over that 91 ohm resistor with a 100 ohm resistor. So that should give us something like 45 ohms or something like that. And that should theoretically brighten up the image. I have not yet tested it, so um, it may not have the desired effect. I don't have the floppy drives connected, so we should just get that message. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot brighter. Oh, cool, that worked. 
Now I can still turn down the, the contrast so that it's not like I have to drive it maxed out all the time, but um, I'd say that that overall looks better. Now on the camera, you're not gonna be able to tell, but it definitely is better. All right, next up are the floppy drives. Now I've gone ahead and I tested these off camera and I did that on my PC, my bench PC, and they worked well. There was no issues actually with these drives. So I think, I, gosh, I can't remember how these went on here to be honest. I think they pretty much sit on the side of the machine like this. There's screws along the top and there's screws on the side and the whole case is a little bit mangled. And the reason why is originally there were two of these disc drives in here and now there is this like standard PC type disc drive in here. The thing is the drives that Tandy used weren't really standard, at least from where the faceplate is. So if I took this TIAC drive here and I installed this correctly, where it were actually in the right screw holes, it would be sticking forward like two or three millimeters so it, the front bezel wouldn't go on. So someone modified this cage in the past to have new holes that were set further back so this non-original disk drive could go in here. Now, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to use this drive in here. I don't have another one of these TRS-80 drives and it's flipped the wrong way and that's just because the way the holes are drilled. And they originally did that because the ribbon cable on here, it just didn't reach unless you flipped it around. Now I have actually modified, or actually, no, I made a whole new cable. This is a new cable. So this does reach now, even if the drive were um, put in the right way, it would all work, but I just have to reinstall it the way it is already. So in here are all the screws and there are a lot of them. So I got to figure out, I think those are the case screws on the outside. These are all the screws that go on the inside. Okay, those are the knobs for the front. And these are the screws. Now, one last thing before I put it together, this is the original fan. It's a Panasonic Panaflow, very good quality fan, but too noisy. So I'm gonna put in something a little more modern and a little quieter. I'm gonna install this, which is what I typically install in most things. This is an Arctic, I don't know, F8 fluid bearing, whatever. They push more air and they're quieter, but they're certainly more crappily made. It's way lighter and obviously a lot thinner than the old Panasonic, but yeah, it'll shift more air and do it a lot more quietly. All right, it's coming together. Front panel's on, pretty much enough screws are on to hold everything together. The keyboard is even connected right now. So let's just give it a smoke test. Make sure it actually works as it should. That should boot CPM here. We're not seeing anything yet. Okay, there's the screen. Oh, look at that, nice. Turn the brightness down a little bit. Yeah, it's looking good. I adjusted the focus. I enlarged the picture a little bit. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna boot the diagnostic disc so we can do the uh, focus test on the CRT. While it boots up, I'll install these two knobs on the front panel here. Uh oh, CRC error, hmm. I'm pretty sure this disc is definitely on the good side. I wonder if this drive is not quite working properly. It's currently loading the ROMs off here because this is a Model 3 disc, even though it's diagnostics for the Model 4. <sighs> CRC error again. Hmm. I'm kind of annoyed. I did test this drive and I know this disc works when we booted off it a bunch of times with the external drive. And yet it starts to load the ROMs and it tells us we have an error. I could try cleaning it again. This is a single-sided drive here, so we'll use my single-sided cleaning disc. I think what I might want to do is take out the drive chassis and swap these two drives around. So this is drive one, this TIAC drive, which is just a better drive. Same thing, CRC error, come on, this is ridiculous. Let's try this disc, which Seth included with his computer. The funny thing is I imaged both of these discs on my PC uh, to IMD images, and they were both kind of flaky, like using a known good drive. that just didn't read quite properly. Uh, if this loads, then what I can do is swap back to the other disc and boot that up. Yeah, it looks like it is loading. So once it boots, then what we can do is I can put this Model 4 disc in here, the diagnostic disc, 
And then we can reboot the machine again because the, the Model 3 ROM, once it loads off the disk, is right protected and doesn't need to load it again. So it should potentially work. There it is, yeah. And then we're gonna go video alignment pattern, that's A. And there's that same test pattern we were looking at on the RGB to HDMI. And you know what? I actually see little jitters all the way along. And it looks not too dissimilar to those jitters that were actually showing up on the RGB to HDMI. So this is interesting because I was using a known good power supply, not the power supply that's currently in this thing that might be flaky or whatever. And I was not using the whole CRT board at all. We were using the RGB to HDMI. So that problem is potentially on the motherboard itself. Now I wonder if I should swap the PLL around, like maybe this is somehow related to that clock, or maybe it's a problem with my 33 picofarad cap that's on there that could be causing this issue as well. Maybe there's a little bit of jitter in the clock. Hmm, very interesting. When I have those new PLLs in here, I'm just gonna swap one in right now. Well, the PLL has changed and unfortunately, I still see that jitter. I see it even actually on the 64 column mode, which is what we're looking at here. Now this could well be unrelated to what we saw on the RGB HDMI and this might be just a power supply issue. Maybe, maybe this thing does need to be recapped. The little jitters seem to be maybe five or six of them across the entire picture and they're kind of rolling and they're not synchronized exactly to the video here. So I'm wondering, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe this power supply is emitting a little bit of inf interference, which is getting picked up by the CRT. I suppose I can test that out by just uh, taking the screws off the top here and just lifting it away from the CRT, see if that interference is something that's being radiated. Okay, that made absolutely no difference whatsoever. How about if I unplug the fan? Maybe the fan is putting a bunch of noise into the system. It was that is the fan. That's unbelievable. It's rock steady now. Look at that. Look at that. I put that crap fan in there and it, uh, it adds interference back into the system, which is visible on the monitor. That is unbelievable. Wow. Well, right here is the connector for the fan and I just jammed a 470 microfarad 16 volt cap in there. And now, it has 100% cleared up all the jitter that was happening on the screen. I tried some smaller values first and they reduced it, but they didn't eliminate it. So once I stuck that 470 in there, now it looks perfect. The assembly process continues. And as you can see, it's actually mostly assembled right now. Just have a few screws left. And in this little container here, I have all the bad parts. And I actually ran this thing doing sort of a bench test for a good amount of time. I left it running for maybe three hours running the RAM diagnostic that's on this Model 4 diagnostic disk. And that just sort of loops through the entire test over and over again, and uh, no issues whatsoever. Also interesting is that the disk that was doing CRC error mostly works now. And I'm wondering if maybe having this thing together again helps the drive read better. This is the RAM test. I think we showed this in a previous video as well, and it would freeze right after this point because it switches to 80 columns. But there we go, it swaps to 80 columns and now it totally works. Now with the machine fully closed like this, the fan that I have swapped out is blowing air through the entire machine. I can feel it coming out of the top here because all of the covers are installed. So that keeps everything on the inside nice and cool. So at this point, I am just gonna put this machine back together completely. That's the TRS-80 Model 4P. I cleaned up the case. I put the back door on. Now, obviously you can notice that the case here is very yellow. It should be this creamy color, like on the bottom of the keyboard. This machine was probably placed with this part down for a very long time. So at some point in the future, I will have to uh, do a little retro bright on it. But for now, we take the cover off like that. And the keyboard just slides out of its little cubby there. And I've already plugged the power cable into the back and we power it on. And this machine is fully functional now. So it attempts to boot up off the A drive. And of course it has the floppy drive not ready message, which is what it should have said from the very beginning 
Here's the Model 4 CPM disc. This was the disc I was trying to boot up from the very beginning and wasn't having any luck. But if we hit the reset button with that in there, this of course will boot properly now, since of course I repaired the 80 columns on this machine. And there it is, CPM Plus. If I put a Model 3 disc in there, it'll load the Model 3 ROMs. Hit the reset button. Once the Model 3 ROMs are loaded into memory like they are now, it is currently write protected. So if I stick in another bootable Model 3 disc like this one and we hit reboot, it will actually boot straight up into that software. And this is normal for the way it should work when everything is fully functional. And there it is. The replacement fan I put in here is much quieter than the original fan. So that's a nice upgrade with the case on there. You can just hear it just sort of whooshing away in there. It's pretty nice. And there it is, we have 13 ghosts. And the music doesn't sound super great on the 4P because it's coming out of that little tiny thing. Maybe a future upgrade will be to install a proper speaker in this thing instead of that little tiny piezo thing. So this game works really well. Now, one thing you may notice is it looks like the graphics is not sort of taking up the whole screen. And that is actually normal for the 4 and the 4P. And that's because it supports 80 columns mode. And when you're in 80 columns mode, you're in 24 lines of text. In this mode right here, since this is a Model 3 game, it's currently running at 64 columns wide and only 16 columns high. So you're losing a certain amount of lines on the top and bottom up here and there. And this monitor, of course, is adjusted to work uh, for 80 column by 24 or 80 by 25 text. Therefore, you don't have uh, all the screen taken up. Now, my Model 4, my regular Model 4, seems to be the same way. If this is not normal, like you're familiar with the 4 and the 4P, and you should be getting full deflection for the 16 column or 16 row modes, definitely let me know. But I think this is completely normal because as soon as you jump into 80 columns mode, you just get extra lines of text on the top and the bottom. What's nice about this game on the Model 4 and the 4P though, is there's absolutely no flicker. I don't know why the uh, status bar is flickering. That just might be because I'm running out of life or, so, or time or something. But on say the TRS-80 Model 1, which this game totally works on, you do get some flicker. <laughs> okay, game over. Graphics are pretty impressive considering this game does work on the 1977 Model 1. All right, that is gonna be it for this video on the TRS-80 Model 4P. I wanna thank Seth for sending this in in the first place. And uh, you know, maybe I should stop this because the music's gonna keep playing. But thank you, Seth, for sending it in. Taking this thing apart initially was a little bit difficult, a little harder than I'm used to actually, just because it's a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, the way this thing works. But once I had it apart, you know, getting it back together was actually relatively easy. It's, it's pretty straightforward as to where things go when you reassemble it at least. As far as figuring out what was wrong with it, well, you know, that PLL seemed like it was the problem, but in the end it wasn't. Now in this little parts bin here, I do have that original chip. The legs were just too short. While it did work in that socket, it felt like if it just got jostled, it might pop out on its own. So I put in one of those new parts in there. So that thing is working. But again, it was pretty surprising to me. And let me just grab the part. Here it is, that little adjustable capacitor. This is what failed on this thing. And I guess uh, talking to Frank, IZ8DWF, he says that this definitely happens. This is made out of little disks and they can come disconnected from each other. So even just sitting there over time, these can fail, which is obviously what happened here. In addition, there seemed to be some power supply issues, but maybe it was just a bad or cold solder joint and I did reflow those. Of course, I did replace the refas, which are also in here. So this thing won't release the smoke with some refa madness. In the second video in the series, trying to figure out why this thing wouldn't run Model 4 software or go into 80 comms mode was a little bit of a trick, but I got to it in the end. And of course, now we have a fully functional machine. So in the future, you'll see this machine again. I will definitely need to take this thing apart again, at least on the outside plastics, and then do a full retrobrite. I actually left off one of the screws that holds on this front bezel because there's one screw, I think it was either down here or down there, which is very difficult to get to. 
And I figured there's enough other screws on this thing to hold that on without issue. And that way in the future, when I take this thing apart again to do the retro bright, to bring it back to the nice white color, I won't have to struggle with this darn screw again. So I think that's gonna be it for TRS-80 stuff, at least for a little while. So if you enjoyed this bleed over Septandi video, <laughs> thumbs up. Uh, if you're sick of TRS-80 videos, definitely let me know, put your comments down below, but I think I won't be working on them for a little while at least because there are so many other things to work on in the basement. So there'll be lots of other interesting things coming up. I wanna thank all my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. I wanna, of course, thank my viewers, you that is. Comment down below, subscribe to all the channels. It really helps out those extra subscriptions. And I guess that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.